So I'm Andy Schuler, uh, professor in, in, in civil engineering, and our guest speaker today is Bill Dempsey from uh, Synergia Ranch here in Santa Fe. And Bill's uh, one of his many claims to fame, I guess, is your manager and I guess designer of some of the systems at Biosphere Two. Originally from Berkeley, California, and I'll keep it short so we can get to this interesting talk today. So thanks for coming down today, Bill. No, oh, you're welcome. Um, I don't know, do we want to try to dim lights, or is this good? Oh, yes, let's do that. Yeah. And the uh, sign is going around. <clears throat> anyway, I'm letting you look at the picture of Biosphere 2 first, but before we start talking in detail, I'm going to lay a foundation of a few ideas. And uh, the only life we know in the universe is on the planet Earth. That's all we know. Well, there might be uh, life elsewhere, and of course there's search for extraterrestrial intelligence and so on. Um, but as a matter of fact, that's all we know, that there is life on planet Earth. We don't know if there's any more in the rest of the universe. But I'm going to raise the question, what is the chance that there isn't any other? Okay? Do the math. There are more than a hundred billion galaxies. And each of these, on average, not every one of course, has more than a hundred billion stars. Okay, that's 10 to the 22nd stars. So suppose you say that the chance that a star could harbor uh, a planet that has life on it is only one in a trillion. That still leaves you with 10 billion biospheres in the universe. So, to me, it's a no-brainer. I think that uh, um, the chances that we're alone in the universe are vanishingly small, infinitesimal. Okay, that raises a question. What is a biosphere? And um, these are the characteristics. By the way, you'll look in a dictionary and you'll see a different definition. I'm fine with that. They can have their definition. But this is, the, this is what I um, think is really the key features. There are multiple interdependent life forms. They're indefinitely self-sustaining and evolving. It's materially closed. That is, no matter goes in or out of the system, at least not on a scale that's important relative to the life processes that are going on. So planet Earth, for example, sure, we have a little bit of meteorite dust falling in from time to time, but if you know how much that is compared to the action of material among life forms on the planet, it's nothing, it's tiny. And it's open to energy and information exchange. So, for example, planet Earth, we get um, light from the sun. That's our energy source. Okay, yes, there's some um, volcanic uh, eruptions and there's some heat coming up from underground, but essentially it's coming from the sun. It's coming from outside the system. The energy is coming from outside the system. And information, well, um, if somebody was looking at us through a telescope from Mars, for example, they would be getting information about going, what goes on in the surface. So information goes in and out. Energy information, but it's materially closed. And it has this um, phenomena that there are all these different life forms and they're interdependent and they're self-sustaining and they're evolving. Well, how would you begin to study biospheres? Well, we have studied our biosphere on planet Earth, but this is only one biosphere. How would you study biospheres as a generic concept? Well, our point of view was the most straightforward way to do it is to build one, operate it, and experiment with it. That was the concept of building Biosphere 2. We call this a new science, Biospherics. 
Now, why is biosphere 2 not a replica of biosphere 1? What do I mean by biosphere 1? I mean the planet Earth. So we called biosphere 2, biosphere 2, well, biosphere 1, they were here first. Um, but uh, there are major, huge differences between biosphere 2. Some people thought that biosphere 2 was a replica of planet Earth. It's not a replica. And here are some of the reasons why. Scale. It's 30 trillion times smaller if you measure by the mass of the atmosphere that's enclosed. Number of species. We had 3,500 species, more or less, uh, of plants and animals in Biosphere 2. There are millions, there are tens of millions of species. We don't know how many species there are on planet Earth. Huge numbers of species. And biomes. We have only five biomes. Uh, what do I mean by a biome? I mean a region where you have a climactic, climatic and uh, uh, consistency and uh, dominant species uh, of the biome. And for example, um, we had five biomes in Biosphere 2. We had a rainforest tropical rainforest, that is. We had an ocean. We had a marsh. We had a savanna. And we had a desert. And then we had two what we call anthropogenic biomes, which were the human habitat and agriculture. Those are different than natural biomes. Agriculture has transformed huge areas on the face of the planet. So we call that an anthropogenic biome. It's man-made. Um, but there are other biomes on planet Earth that we didn't have, like tundra, for example, um, deciduous rainforest or deciduous forest, coniferous forest. We didn't have those. Some people think there are as many as 30 biomes on the planet Earth. Some people say seven. Um, there's a range of opinions on that. Anyway, we had five natural biomes and we had two anthropogenic or man-made biomes. There are other differences inside Biosphere 2. There was no wind. Well, you can say, yes, there was a little bit of wind because we had some air handling units and the air to control the temperature and humidity, and the air handling units discharged a stream of air, and right in front of them, there was wind right there. But effectively, throughout the ecosystems inside, there was no real substantial wind. It was just as calm as this room. Um, there were limited temperature range, uh, 50 Fahrenheit to 100 Fahrenheit, more or less. Uh, there were much more extreme temperatures on Earth. Um, there are no storms, there are no floods, there's no drought, there's no fire, no lightning. Uh, reduced solar intensity because the sunlight is shining through glass and we estimated that the net and there's also a space frame structure causing shadows and the um, net um, amount of solar energy reaching the place where the plants were growing uh, was only about half of the outside light intensity. And there was a limited solar spectrum because, again, the sunlight went through glass. For example, the glass cuts out the ultraviolet. In fact, we put, because we were concerned about that lack of ultraviolet and we were aware that uh, some insects, for example, use ultraviolet for navigation, um, we put a few very select panes of glass in the very special places just to let ultraviolet in. A quartz glass, basically. It would let some ultraviolet in. Um, but dominantly speaking, there was not uh, ultraviolet throughout Biosphere 2. Um, no erosion, there's no stratosphere. Um, these are processes that happen in the stratosphere that influence our biosphere. So we didn't have those uh, features. So Biosphere 2 was significantly different than Biosphere 1. And it means that there we've created a biosphere that is different, and therefore it is beginning this process of, of building, operating, and experimenting with uh, biospheres. 
So now I'm going to go back to the picture and take a little tour here through Bysure. Now this whole thing right here is an airtight building. And uh, I'll talk more about these domes on the side. Uh, those are expansion chambers. Um, and they're connected by underground tunnels to the atmosphere in the main structure. It's almost impossible to get an idea from a photograph how big Biosphere 2 is. The length from this end to that end is 540 feet. Anybody know how long Centennial Hall is? It's about 270 feet. In other words, the length of that building from there to there is twice the length of Centennial Hall. And the width of um, this from here to there is wider than Centennial Hall. Uh, it's more than three acres footprint on the ground, Biosphere 2. So um, we have several sections here. This tall section uh, on this end is the rainforest area, which had tropical rainforest. The long section in the center had uh, savanna and ocean and marsh. And the section at the other end is desert. So um, those are the five wilderness biomes that we had. This section with the multiple arches, that was the agriculture. We called it the intensive agriculture. It's the farm where the people who lived inside grew their food that they ate. And on the front is the habitat. That's uh, where the, the people lived. Um, they had many facilities also in, in that habitat. That tower right on the top right there, the library is at the top. And uh, to give a sense of scale, by the way, this little red spot right there, that's a pickup truck. And over on this side is the energy center. And I'll talk much more about energy supply uh, into Biosphere 2. Um, most of this area, is, except for the habitat area, is glazed, so natural sunlight shines in to grow plants. And in the background is our research and development complex that we built in advance of uh, Biosphere 2 for, to do some research preliminary to the main construction. Here's the uh, rainforest. That um, mountain in the center is artificially constructed of concrete. It's an artificial mountain. It had a pond on top. Um, I'll just comment about why would we have a pond on top. Well, we didn't think that we would know in advance how all the species inside Biosphere 2 um, would like to live, what, what, they, their place, what they would find their place to be. So we created a variety of echo niches and allowed the system to be self-organizing. And, um, and one of the echo niches was this pond that we created on top. Here's a waterfall coming off of that same mountain. Here's a pond, another pond. Uh, this is a pond at the bottom of the waterfall. And here is a stream running through the savanna. And that was kept operating by a pump. Well, on planet Earth, of course, streams and waterfalls and things like that operate because the energy of sunlight evaporates water and it goes up in the sky and rains down and the flow goes around. But um, we didn't have the luxury, mainly because of scale in Biosphere 2, that all those processes were going to happen. So we had to substitute, in many ways, uh, artificial processes for natural processes. This is a view um, looking over the marsh and ocean toward the rainforest. Here's a picture of the ocean. That's approximately a million gallons. It's about 150 feet long and 60 feet wide. In the deepest place, it was 25 feet deep. Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit about what happens at the other end. One of the things that happens in a real ocean is that there are waves. And many species that live in oceans depend on waves because it makes water movement. And um, 
filter feeders, for example, their food is brought to them by the movement of water. And so we had to have water movement in order for the life systems in the ocean to get their food. Now, there's a little problem, is if you're going to make waves by doing something with pumps, then all that ocean water is going to go through the pump. And when uh, the impeller of a pump is driving that water, it's going to chew up all little microorganisms to little bits and kill them. So we had to have a way to make that wa wave action without using a pump. And at the end of the ocean there, across uh, the front, there's an open mouth that's about 60 feet wide, uh, an open mouth under the water, and in the chamber at the top, which is right there, um, we suck a vacuum. So the vacuum is sucking the ocean water up inside, and then at the moment after it's sucked up, we open the little valves at the top and let the air rush back in. The water that's sucked up inside falls down and surges out the mouth, and that produces this ocean propagating across the uh, surface. Not a, this a wave. Um, not a big wave. They were about a foot high. Um, we soon learned, um, after initial trials, that that wave very rapidly was eroding the beach and taking it away from us. So we built this little breakwater there. Just one of the little tricks you have to uh, discover and deal with when you're trying to build something as complex as a biosphere. Here's another picture on the surface of the ocean, which again maybe helps to give you a sense of how big the whole thing is. And here's with the camera right at the water line. We had coral reefs uh, that we brought from the Caribbean. And there were about, uh, um, I think, 70 species of coral in there. Uh, one of the things that happened during the time um, was that the coral reefs increased, so they were re reproducing. Um, by the way, um, one thing I didn't say right at the beginning, which I should say, is that our initial trial of Biosphere 2 with eight human beings as inhabitants inside was we closed it for two years. So eight human beings went in there to live in there for two years, sustain themselves by growing food on the intensive agriculture area, um, regenerating the oxygen by the growth of the plants inside, and all of their wastes was being used to feed nutrients back to the agriculture area, and water is internally recycled inside. So um, two years, eight people um, uh, living inside. They all survived. In fact, they all came out healthier in the end than when they went in. Here's a picture of them. Uh, this is taken after one year from the photographer who was outside taking the picture through the glass. And this gentleman right here uh, was a very well-known gerontologist, a researcher in aging. And um, one of the um, important things about um, his research was that he had um, and written a book about it, um, maybe multiple books, um, found that if you um, have a low-calorie diet but high-nutrient diet, that this um, um, experiments with animals and even some populations of people that have been seen, that this is correlated with much longer lifespan and much healthier life. So, any of you are interested in that, that's, um, and you'll notice, uh, if you look closely at these guys, these guys are fairly uh, thin. Uh, this guy, for example, was a much heavier set guy at the beginning. He lost about, I don't know, 30 pounds or something. Um, but anyway, I mentioned that thing about diet because that was exactly the diet that the eight biospherians had. And so for two years, he had a captive group where he knew exactly what everybody ate. 
and he had a whole battery of uh, uh, diagnostic um, processes to measure one's biological age as compared to one's calendar age. They all got younger while they were inside Biosphere 2. That's why I say when they came out, they were healthier than, than they went in. Area. Uh, under construction, uh, not grown up. And I'll comment about, uh, in order to kind of give an idea of what the logistical issues are building a structure of this size, uh, we brought uh, mangroves from the Everglades to stock this marsh area. And we brought 200 of them. And every one of them came in a, in a crate that was four feet wide by four feet long by four feet tall and weighed about two tons. And, um, and it had, during the transport from Florida to Arizona, um, it had um, water that was part of the marsh there and it, and we also gave it light. So we had them in a trailer, a tractor trailer, which was outfitted with artificial lights and pumps to keep the water circulating while it drove across the country. Um, and there were 200 of those crates. And uh, we staged them initially in a separate greenhouse and then moved them in, into Biosphere 2. Uh, so a huge logistical effort to build Biosphere 2. And um, um, of course, the marsh was only one of the smaller biomes in the, in the space. And this is the desert. Um, we knew it was going to be humid inside, so we selected um, what is called a fog desert for the type of desert that we put in. And um, this is uh, Baja, California, for example. And where it does not rain very much, but, um, and it is a desert, but it's a humid desert. And here is a cross-section of the habitat area showing some of the complexity that's there. Um, over on this side, we had individual living spaces for, or an apartment, if you will, for each person, although two people would share one bathroom. Um, we had an animal area. We have domestic animals inside, which were goats, chickens, pigs, and fish. Uh, so they had some um, animal products to eat as well as uh, plants. Um, we had an exercise room. Uh, the library was up at the top. Um, a dining room and kitchen area here. We had an analytic, chemi chemical analytical lab to study things that are happening inside Biosphere 2. We had a medical laboratory so that uh, uh, the people could be examined for their current health condition. And the medical doctor was the same gentleman who I mentioned before. Um, his name was Roy Walford. And um, um, uh, he was the doctor that examined everybody. We had a machine shop so that we could uh, maintain and uh, uh, repair equipment as needed. Uh, that was down down here, um, and some other smaller spaces. Uh, this is the apartment of one person, and you'll see right in the corner there. That's the edge of a spiral staircase. The bedroom was on the second level, and this was a living room he had. And this is the library. We had about a thousand uh, books of general reading uh, nature. Now we're looking at the agriculture area. This is approximately a one half acre area. And um, you can see there are different crops in sections here. Um, they basically use 50 different uh, crops for their food uh, supply. And uh, although there were something like 150 different cultivars of one sort or another that they experimented did little things with, but mainly it was 50 different uh, crops uh, that they used. And here's some activity harvesting. Um, that's Mark Nelson, by the way, the person I mentioned you'd like to talk to. And here's another person working there. You'll notice on her hip 
there's a walkie-talkie radio. That was one thing that we used throughout the project, that all the Biospherians carried a walkie-talkie radio um, to communicate with each other, and the people on the outside had their walkie-talkie radios too. I was one of the people on the outside, and I had my walkie-talkie radio, and there's a lot of ch chatter uh, going back and forth, all, you know, di on and on and on and on. What's going on? What's happening here? This thing isn't working. How do we fix it? Da, da, da. And uh, goats uh, were among the animals. This picture actually wasn't from inside Biosphere 2, but I include it just so you get the idea. And here's the kitchen. All electric cooking, we wouldn't want to burn a flame in Biosphere 2 because that would have a very uh, strong impact on the atmosphere. And here's preparing a, a uh, meal. And here is a feast. Um, they would have any excuse they could come up with to um, have a, a feast. Um, you know, two years is a long time. You want to have um, celebratory events as often as you can, make life interesting, and so on. So, I mean, this is not like there wasn't any food in there. But it was, it was difficult uh, a little bit because in the first year especially, um, they were only getting about, uh, uh, about 1,600 calories a day out of, their, uh, out of the garden. It improved. I think they came up to about 2,000 in the second year as they learned. And here is a greeting uh, through the glass. Um, this was typical of how you met people. This is Mark on the inside. Um, this man is John Allen, who is the person who conceived and invented the idea and founded the project. Um, this is Oleg Gazenko, a very notable Russian scientist uh, with whom we had uh, a lot of collaboration. And there they are greeting through the glass. That's the way they would shake hands, so to speak. Put your hand on the glass uh, opposite uh, the other person. Waste. How do we treat the human wastes? Um, and the animal wastes also, for that matter. Uh, we had what we called a wastewater garden. The waste first went to a septic tank, just an ordinary septic tank, and then the effluent from the septic tank went in progressively through these planting beds, and uh, those plants are extracting nutrients and pathogens and uh, and uh, uh, cleaning it up, basically. Um, and there's our expert on, on issues related to that, but uh, this isn't the time for talking about that right now, um, except just to mention that we have that. Then afterwards, this water went back to irrigate the, um, uh, the, the garden, the farm. So the nutrients were, that the humans were taking out of the farm by eating them were going back into the farm with the wastewater. Now, in order to maintain conditions inside Biosphere 2, it had to be intensively irrigated. If you look at it from one point of view, it's a big glass box sitting in the sun in Arizona. Well, I'm sure you all understand what happens in a big glass box in the sun um, in Arizona. It gets very hot. So there was a great deal of uh, uh, cooling that had to be occurred. And in, also in winter time, by the way, it even snowed at the site, so you had to heat the space as well. Um, from the standpoint of an energy efficient building, it's the worst possible building you can imagine. It's glass, the sun shines in everywhere, there's no insulation, um, that's it. So um, I calculated the uh, Solar uh, load was 25 million BTUs per hour, uh, which is a lot. And the way it was cooled was by um, circulating from the energy center outside into the space, chilled water, cool, uh, evaporatively cooled water and chilled water, um, which did not ever mix. It was all contained in closed piping systems. It would never mix with any of the ecological system water inside. Um, but it did carry the energy. It carried heat and cooling energy. 
uh, and these are some of the pipes that we had in basement areas uh, to make that happen. This is the discharge mouth of an air handling unit. Um, these were large units. They're 12 feet wide by 9 feet high and about as long as this room, about 30 feet long. Each one of them moved 50,000 cubic feet per minute and um, there were 25 of them in Biosphere 2 in order to maintain uh, temperature and humidity conditions. And I'm going to talk more about the detail of their operation a little later. This is a gentleman uh, a researcher in Hawaii, his name is Claire Folsom, and um, he had the idea back in the 1960s to um, uh, study what happens in a closed ecological system. And this flask is one of his flasks, and he would go down to the ocean beach in Hawaii and he would collect some sand and ocean water and then he'd put a, a cork in the top and, and seal it up and then observe what happens. And he observed, interesting thing is that once you get some life going inside these things, as long as you didn't exceed um, temperature limits um, of, you know, above freezing and not too hot, um, none of these things would ever die. They would live indefinitely for decades. They would continue living. You'd get all kinds of microbial forms inside and you could see often changes in color and um, uh, things that would tell you that there were all sorts of biological things going inside, but they would never die. They would go on and on and on. In this particular one, there's a shrimp. I don't know if you can see it there in that projection. There's a shrimp and there's algae at the bottom. And that shrimp was living off of the oxygen produced by the algae, and the algae was living off of the carbon dioxide produced by the shrimp. And these uh, would last for about five years. The shrimp, shrimp would not reproduce, even if there were several shrimp inside. And there was a company in Tucson that made these commercially. They called them ecospheres. They were about this big, or you could get a bigger one, um, and you'd buy them. I used to have one of those. Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, although I wouldn't really quite consider that a full-fledged biosphere, it certainly was an ecosphere, and they called it an ecosphere. Uh, this is the test module that we built prior to building the main biosphere too, uh, which we did for purposes of testing the ceiling of glazing. Uh, and then we began to do experimentation inside, uh, living inside. This shows an overview of our research and development complex that we had prior to building Biosphere 2, which is under construction in the background. And this now um, shows a collection of uh, species. This was taken in South America. This is a termite mound. And uh, we had many places we went around the world to get the species that we put in, in Biosphere 2. Here's collecting coral reefs in the Caribbean. And here is the research vessel Heraclitus that we ourselves built in 1974 and 1975. By we ourselves, I mean the core team that built Biosphere 2. We built it ourselves by hand. Um, this is an 82-foot long sailing vessel, uh, Chinese junk design, built out of ferro-cement and with aluminum rigging. That's a long story in itself, and I don't have time to go into the whole thing right now. And here is a picture of the energy center, which I mentioned before. Energy was supplied from outside into Biosphere 2. Um, we have our own electric power generators. We had three of them, one and a half, one and a half, and two and a quarter megawatt generators. Um, we had uh, uh, compression refrigeration cooling uh, using ammonia chillers uh, to produce the cold water that I mentioned before that was necessary to cool the space. And we had evaporatively cooled water. Um, these are the cooling towers uh, that cooled water evaporatively. Um, Biosphere 2 used a lot of energy. 
Um, the main way that you dissipate heat, which of course was pouring into Biosphere 2 by sunlight, um, but also heat that was necessary because of the operation of the electric generators, um, was uh, the main way that one does that economically is to evaporate water. On a hot summer day, we were evaporating about 200,000 gallons of water a day. And here's one of the one and a half megawatt generators. We used waste heat from that to operate an absorption chiller, by the way. And here are the ammonia chillers. And here is how uh, heating and cooling worked in Biosphere 2. Sunlight is streaming in and making the air warmer. Um, plants are evapotranspiring and moisture is coming into that air. Um, you have to remove the moisture and you have to cool the air in order for this process to be sustained. If the moisture just went into the air indefinitely, it would become saturated, 100% humidity, evapotranspiration would stop and the plants would die. So the air handler is in the basement. This is this large air handler I mentioned before. It is sucking air in with a fan. The first coil that it encounters, which is like the radiator of your car, that is that outside water from the energy center is circulating in that coil, but it's not leaking water into biosphere. Um, it's just carrying the heat, cooling or the heating. Uh, the air touches this first coil, which is just evaporatively cooled water, maybe 45, 50 degrees. The air is cooled partially. Then the air is cooled by chilled water. And you see these drips in the diagram there that represent the condensation that occurs because of the cooling of the moist air on the coils. And that's how we recycled the water inside Biosphere 2 by collecting it uh, as condensate on the cooling coils. At this point, the air is too cold for the space. It might be 40 degrees or something like that. So you have to reheat it with hot water that is circulated from the energy center. So a very in energy intensive process, but still in conventional processes, that's about the best you can do. Um, but by this process, we would collect between five and 10,000 gallons a day of distilled, essentially distilled water, pure water, for re-irrigating the plants, for drinking water, for bathing, for whatever the needs of the biospherians were. And then the air would circulate back through the space. Now this diagram is also good because it gives me a chance to talk about sealing and air tightness. To make biosphere too tight, um, you can't count on the ground being a seal. You can't even count on concrete being a seal. Concrete is porous. So there's a stainless steel liner all the way under the bottom, which joins to the glazing system at the edges uh, in order to seal the concrete at the bottom. And here is constructing the rainforest area. One of the things that um, in the design we planned was put um, channels under the welded seams of the stainless steel liner so that we could detect leaks. And the way we detected leaks was that if there was a trace gas in the atmosphere or biosphere, and if any of it was leaking out, and if it came through a welded seam, it would show up in one of these channels, which was under the liner. It was outside biosphere. And by sucking a sample of air at the, from the end of that channel outside and, and detecting for that trace gas, you could find if there was a leak. And I did that work, and I did find some leaks. And then later, we repaired some of those leaks and, and so on. And here is how, when we had a concrete structural column inside Biosphere 2, how we maintained the integrity of the, li of the liner. Uh, the column would be resting on, internally on the floor of Biosphere 2, like maybe the square, for example, would be an example of a column coming down. But as I said before, concrete is not airtight. So what we did is we set a stainless steel plate on top of the concrete foundation that is underneath, welded rebars on top of the stainless steel plate, 
there was a mating set of rebars that were welded on the bottom of the plate, went down into the foundation, and then the stainless steel liner is welded to the edge of that plate. So that's how you get this liner to go under the column and seal it without breaking the structural strength of the column. And prior to sealing Biosphere 2, we were looking for any leaks that we could. So you see a welded seam here, and this is about a foot deep of water that we flooded uh, the basement areas. And we pumped pressurized air into those channels that I mentioned before. And if there was a leak anywhere, you'd get bubbles coming up and you would see it. And we found a few and fixed them before we sealed Biosphere 2. And here is the glazing going on system. The glazing was sealed to the structural frame with a uh, silicon seal. Just the same ordinary stuff you buy in your hardware store in a tube. RTV silicon seal. But the design of the joint was rather special. And now I'm talking more about those domes. This is what we call the lung. If you ask yourself the question, what happens inside Biosphere 2 when the sunlight shines in and the air gets warm, well, what happens? The air is going to expand, right? Or when it gets cold, it's going to co um, um, collapse. And what would happen if you didn't deal with that problem is that the pressure it would create inside the main structure would be enough to burst the building. Very easy back of the envelope calculation. Um, or when it cools, the atmospheric pressure on the outside and the um, contracted air on the inside would differential pressure, you'd crush the building. So we provided an underground tunnel from inside to this tank outside. Um, and you see right there is the mouth of that tunnel. Uh, so that the air could flow under this and we cover over this tank with a flexible membrane so that the air has room to expand, but not leak. Still contained, expand, but not leak. This dish is an aluminum dish. It weighs about 15 tons, and it is connected to the edge of the membrane, as you'll see in the next picture. Um, well, that's the, the tunnel going through. Here's the membrane being placed around the edge of that dish, uh, which connects the edge of the tank to the dish to seal is sort of like a donut, a half of a donut shape. And here it is being inflated for the first time. Um, those tanks were 158 feet in diameter, the dish is 90 feet in diameter, and the range of motion of the uh, dish up and down to absorb the expansion contraction is about 45 feet. Typical day, night, and two lungs was 20 feet up and down. So this is not a small amount. I, the volume that we allowed in here was 30%, uh, the variable volume, 30% of the volume of the main structure. And there is the dish being photographed from underneath inside, being raised simply by the expansion pressure of the air. It looks like this would create a lot of pressure. Well, the dish weighs 15 tons, but it's spread over such a large area that it's only a half an inch of water column. Uh, pressure inside. And this now describes how we managed to um, neutralize the pressure. One of the things about leakage is that inevitably there are going to be small holes somewhere in that structure. It's just not possible, practical matter, to build a structure like that uh, without having some leak somewhere. Um, so to reduce leaks, what we designed was um, there's a dome, which is for a weather cover, over the flexible membrane, which goes up and down. And that dome is not airtight, but it's air resistant. So there's a fan in the side of that blowing air out of the dome, which creates suction under the dome and gives a little bit of uplift weight to the membrane so that the pressure that is created by the weight of the membrane resting on the air is neutralized. And by operating this fan automatically controlled, controlled by a center of the pressure differential between the inside and the outside, we could maintain um, 
about uh, eight pascals of pressure. It's about a thousandth of a psi of pressure difference between the inside and the outside, all was uh, dynamically maintaining that pressure difference at all times. And that was one of the key technologies uh, uh, that I developed to uh, seal Biosphere 2. And this talks now about leakage. In an ordinary building like this one, you have a lot of leakage occurring. You generally talk about number of air changes, several air changes per day, or if it's a very tight building, it might be down to, what, five or 10 air changes per day. Air changes, that means the entire content of air in the building exchanges with the outside air. Well, if you consider all the factors of temperature changes and barometric pressure changes and changes in humidity, which are a third factor, inside the space because humidity in the air is a gas and it adds or subtracts as it is more or less humid to the um, uh, volume of atmosphere inside. Uh, these are the fluctuations that you get and here's a calculation over a 120 day span. Every one of these little squares would be the amount of leakage in percent of the volume of the space um, every single day. And by leakage, I don't mean just leakage out or leakage in. I mean exchange of the air inside and outside. These are the percentage of leakage you would get every single day um, just by those factors of expansion contraction. And of course, every one of those exchanges of air between inside and outside means your original air that's inside which you're trying to study and understand the dynamic processes of the biological interactions, photosynthesis and respiration, that's all getting washed away. It's all being taken outside. And if you allow that rate of leakage to occur on a daily basis, this is the curve that would show you how much of your original air you would still have after so many days. All gone disappears. doesn't matter how much effort you make to try to seal the structure, because if you seal it and seal it and seal it, if you don't have an expansion contraction chamber and you succeed in sealing it, what you're going to do is you're going to break the building. The expansion contraction will destroy the building. In Biosphere 2, because of the sealing work and the uh, expansion contraction chambers, this was our track less than 10% per year leakage per day. I say I could document for certain that it was 10 per, no more than 10%. I think it was actually about 5%. But that is the persistence of your original air over a period of time. And we could verify that. We had trace gases spiked in the atmosphere of Biosphere 2. One of them was helium that has no interaction with the life forms inside. And so we would measure how much of the original helium was in the air. Of course, if it's leaking in and out, that means it would be getting polluted by the mixture of outside air coming in. Two different laboratories measured the helium over a period of 500 days, year and a half. Um, this is the amount of helium that uh, concentration of helium originally and at later times that they found. And another gas we used was sulfur hexafluoride to do exactly the same thing. And this now shows the dynamics of carbon dioxide and oxygen in Biosphere 2. Of course, what's happening is that the uh, plants are growing, they're photosynthesizing, they are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting oxygen back into the atmosphere. That's sustaining the people living inside, for example. And then the plants are growing and photosynthesizing by the energy of sunlight. So this is showing our daily variations in oxygen in carbon dioxide concentration um, throughout the course of four days. And this is the outside sunlight during the day. And 
you'll notice this is ranging about 600 parts per million up and down. You'll notice there's a little wiggle right there in that, in that CO2 curve. And what is it on that third day? This was a cloudy day. So we could tell if a cloud was going over the site by our carbon dioxide readings inside biosphere two. This is the seasonal. This is 200 days from closure in September of 1991, and this peak of carbon dioxide up to uh, nearly 3,500 parts per million, and then coming back down again, is in the dead of winter, when we had little sunlight. Here is the curve of the sunlight intensity. Notice we had a series of cloudy days, uh, stormy weather basically outside, where we had almost no sunlight, and of course the carbon dioxide is spiking up during that time. Now another phenomenon that we had, of course, which was of intense interest. Many people criticized it as saying, oh, Biosphere 2 doesn't work, and blah, 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 blah. But for us, we're researching, we're experimenting. We don't know what is going to happen. We didn't know what was going to happen in this system from the beginning. Its purpose is to do research on closed ecological systems or closed biospheres. We lost oxygen. Oxygen went down. This is a period of 475 days, so that's well over a year, from normal 21% composition in the atmosphere down to 14.5%. That sounds kind of dangerous. How it long was, did you go? yeah. At that point, we injected oxygen for the health of the biospherians who continued out to day 730. Um, but the important thing about this from a research point of view is that we were able to measure this and document it and we were able to find where this oxygen went, which is a somewhat of a long story, an imbalance between uh, photosynthesis and respiration, but then it was combined with a complicating factor, which was excess carbon dioxide was being captured by exposed concrete inside, so that it was a mystery, because we didn't see the carbon dioxide show up that you would expect matching the loss of oxygen. It didn't appear, and where did it go? It was a big mystery for a while until we discovered where it went through isotopic trace analysis studies, etc. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make here about this is that this compares that rate of oxygen loss with what would have happened if it had not been sealed. And this is by computer simulation of the same curve, hypothetically introducing other leak rates. Well, if it had been perfectly sealed, the curve that I just showed before is this curve B, by the way, that was the actual descent of oxygen. If it had been perfectly sealed, this curve A, that would be 100% perfectly, 0% leakage, 100% closure. If you allowed as much as 50% per year leakage, then you would get curve C, 100% per year, curve D, 400% per year, curve E, 1.9% per day, why do I pick that really odd seeming number? That's curve F at the top. That's how much the space shuttle leaks. 10% per day, that would be that curve at the top. Why am I interested in that number? That's the amount of air leakage that NASA has in their closed ecological system experiment in Florida. I went to a conference where somebody in 1992 and I listened to a guy talking about, we have 10% per day leakage. Of course, that's drastically less than an ordinary building like the building we're in. And he was proud of it. I was scratching my head. Are you kidding? 10% per day leakage. That means essentially that you cannot study the dynamics of the atmosphere in a closed ecological system. You don't have it because it's always being washed away by the leakage to the outside. Anyway, because of the fact of the trace gas analysis and some other studies that I did, we could prove that Biosphere 2 was well, well sealed. We got very good dynamic analysis of the atmosphere. 
And uh, this is an artist concept of maybe some future biosphere somewhere on Mars or wherever you might have where people are living and working and producing their food. So uh, that's it. Um, I'll Thank take for a few questions. anything. How much did this cost? Two hundred million dollars. It was privately funded, and uh, for one thing, uh, we didn't even s try to get any government uh, grants or anything like that. A government project, you would never do this. Um, you simply wouldn't be allowed. It would die in a thousand committees saying we should do this, we should do that. You, you would never get to building a project like this, but privately funded. What was the schedule for the project and what's going on with the um, uh, It was uh, built in a course of about three years from 1988 to 1991. The, team of eight biospherians inhabited for two years till September of 1993. Um, we had begun to have um, another team of uh, rotating teams since our concept of the project was that this would go on for a hundred years and that we would witness the development of ecosystems from infancy to maturity and beyond and collect all that data about the dynamics of a system. So we had started with a second crew. Um, we came to a point where we were unable to continue with our financial partner. And so we were unable to continue that original vision of the project. Um, it became operated by Columbia University for a while and is currently being operated for, by University of Arizona. And they're doing experiments inside, but it's no longer sealed. One of the things that was lost in that transition to new management was they didn't maintain a, a sealed system. And um, they did, I think, frankly, that they couldn't deal with the human safety issues for human beings living in a system like this. Or it's complex, as I think you can, can see. Um, so they're using it for experiments that I think basically you could do in a, in a large greenhouse, uh, um, which is sad for us because this project, of course, was, had a tremendous vision to it. Um, but nevertheless, and it's still there, and it's being used, um, University of Arizona. Any questions? You, you have pictures of you going all over the world to pick out these species. It seems a little bit, so then you're, you're sort of synthesizing some ecosystems, or was your, was your strategy to go ahead and just get a whole bunch from a single ecosystem that already are working together? Was there that thought? It seemed like you were sort of well, having a lot of yeah. things that aren't used to living together. And well, together. well, no, but be, so we created these different biomes. If you remember, I mentioned before the tropical rainforest biome, the savanna, the ocean, the marsh, and the desert. And so we did collect species that did work together within a re the region of their biome. And one of the more interesting aspects of the study that this whole project was intended to initiate was what are the dynamics of those biomes of each other? You know, on Earth you observe phenomena like one biome will invade another, you know, over years, decades, uh, millennia even. Um, but what are all the dynamics that happen in a closed system? And the important thing about Biosphere 2 is that it was closed. And that, so you know, and it's a relatively finite space. You can access um, uh, the things that are happening inside and you observe them and measure them, particularly the atmosphere, of course. On planet Earth, you don't know where things come from and go to. It's too big. Uh, an eco, what, this is why a bio, biospherics is different from ecology. E, people will study an ecology of a um, uh, um, watershed or a pond, but there aren't boundaries. Things come into and go out of uh, those. You don't really know. It's not a completely closed system.
you have questions, I'm sure you can come up. Yeah, thank you.